Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our very first Reefs Go Live of 2020. We are so excited to have all of you joining us today. I know we have so many schools joining us from the Cayman Islands, the United States, as well as the UK, and we do want to give a special shout out to St. Bridget's School in England for joining us today. My name is Allie, and I am going to be your top side host for the broadcast today. I will be joined by our underwater educator, Maisie, who you guys will meet very, very shortly. I want to start off today by letting you know that our broadcast is all about incredible invertebrates. You guys should have an activity sheet that you can work on throughout the entire broadcast. And this brings me to the point that our broadcast today is interactive. We want you guys to participate as much as possible. So if you have any questions in regards to your activity sheets, anything we say today or anything you see, please send them in. You should have a chat box on your computer and please be able to send them in. We're going to try and answer as many questions as we can through throughout the entire lesson. Before we head underwater, I do wanna go ahead and start with a little overview of what today's lesson is gonna do and some of those key objectives. We're gonna start off by defining what an invertebrate is. Then we're gonna describe some common invertebrates and where they live on the reef. Then we're gonna explain why these invertebrates are so important for healthy reef ecosystems. And finally, we're gonna discuss how we can manage these populations and what we can do to protect them. All right, I think we're all ready to get started up here. So Maisie, why don't you go ahead and say hello before we dive into the incredible world of these invertebrates. Hi everyone. As Ali said, my name is Maisie and I am lucky enough to be your underwater host today. And we are coming from you live from a coral reef surrounding Little Cayman, which is super cool. We are very, very stoked to be here. So let's get started with the topic of our broadcast. What is an invertebrate? So an invertebrate is a creature that lacks a backbone. So very different from you and I. And this backbone actually normally protects something called a spinal cord, which is a really big bundle of nerves and aids communication between the brain and different parts of the body. So super cool. Awesome. So Maisie, could you tell us, because we have a spine, does that mean that we're not invertebrates? That is totally correct, Ali. We are not invertebrates. We are vertebrates. So we have this backbone and we have this spinal cord, which, as I said before, allows us to have communication between our brains and other parts of our body, which makes us relatively complex compared to a lot of invertebrates. So, for example, if I accidentally bash my knee right now onto the sand down here, it would send off messages that would go all the way along my leg, up my spinal cord and into my brain and it would set off my pain receptors. So I have good communication between all parts of my body. Now invertebrates don't have this and it makes them relatively more simple. Although there are some complex invertebrates like squid and octopus for example. That's great to know Maisie, thank you. Colette from Mary C. Dondera was asking a little bit about invertebrates and she wanted to know if they were a group of animals or specific species. And I think that that answers her question, that invertebrates is a group of species, or a group of animals that has many different species involved with it. But do you think you could tell us some common invertebrate species, Maisie? Of course I can. So, there are so many different invertebrate species on the planet. In fact, 95% of all described species are invertebrates. That's insane. That's such a huge percentage. Now, of all the invertebrates that we're finding, there are quite a lot of them that are on land. These are mainly insects that we're finding. But also, there's lots of invertebrates underwater. And if we look at the huge coral reef that I have right behind me, then most of the species making up this coral reef are actually invertebrates. So we have lots of corals, lots of soft corals, sponges, zoanthids, anemones, for example. But then we also have lots of mollusks and squids and snails and octopuses, which are all invertebrate species as well. Wow, Maisie, over 95%, that's a huge amount. 
That definitely helps us answer Eliza's question from Mary C. Dondero as well about how many different species there are. 95% really is a huge amount. So do you think you could tell us, I'm guessing, since there are so many different species, they've been around for a very long time, right? That is correct, Ali. Actually, the first ever species described are marine invertebrates. And they evolved around 500 million years ago. That's such a long time ago. So us vertebrates actually evolved from these marine invertebrates. So we've been around for a much smaller amount of time. Now, because these invertebrates have been around for such a long time, it means they've been able to adapt and to evolve to lots of different environments. So, just to kind of represent this diversity, let's think about the biggest marine invertebrate on the planet. That is a colossal squid, and that can get up to 40 feet long. That's huge! Now let's compare that to the smallest invertebrate, and that is something called a rotifer, and we can't even see that with the human eye. Wow, that is amazing. That definitely answers Teresa's question from Terra Nova School about what the largest invertebrate is. The colossal squid with 40 feet really is big. It's amazing that there really can be so much variety. We vertebrates are definitely the minority here. Do you think you could show us some common invertebrate species down there on the reef? Of course I can. Now the species that I'm going to speak about first of all is actually a collection of species. And that is the corals themselves. So we can see this huge ball behind me. And a lot of this is actually made out of corals. Now we've gone over coral biology in a lot of our previous Reef Sky Live broadcasts, but I know that not all of you have been able to join us for those. So let's quickly take a recap on coral biology. What I want you guys at home and at school to imagine is a jellyfish. Now I want you to flip this jellyfish upside down with its tentacles sticking up to the sky and its mouth in the center. And there you have a coral polyp. So a coral itself is actually formed out of hundreds and sometimes even thousands of these coral polyps with their little tentacles in the air. So we actually have a coral that's right down here and we can see some of the coral polyps that are making it up. Now what is really cool about these corals is that inside those little tentacles we actually have an algae called Zooxanthellae, which is undertaking photosynthesis, just like a lot or all algaes do. And actually, this algae is providing the coral with most of its food source, which is a really cool symbiotic relationship that we have there. That is amazing, Maisie. So coral is a sessile invertebrate that just sits on the reef and makes its home there. Are there other invertebrate species like this? There are lots of other invertebrate species like this. We have one right here, but I'm actually just going to reverse a bit. And we're going to go and look at this massive sponge that we have right over here as well. Now, this sponge is another sessile invertebrate. I'm definitely not seeing a backbone on this creature. Now, sponges are really, really simple creatures. We actually have lots of holes just on the surface here that are drawing through water and it's filtering, around, filtering out all the different particles and pumping them out this massive hole that we have right up the top here. So they are another really cool sessile invertebrate that we'll find on the reef. That's really cool, Maisie. Thank you for sharing that with us. We have so many questions coming in right now, and I think now would be a really excellent time to answer some. But before we do, how are you doing on air down there, Maisie? I am all good to go. Thank you very much. Very good to hear. So our first question is coming from Oscar, and he is wondering how many invertebrates are there? How many different kinds? That is a great question, and unfortunately one that is basically impossible for me to answer underwater. But let's think back to 
earlier in this broadcast when I said that 95% of all species were invertebrates. So there has got to be thousands of them down here on the reef around me. That's great. Another question we have coming in from Chelsea, and she is wondering, are there any invertebrates that can move? That is a great question, and what we're going to do is I actually want us to swim over here, and we're going to have a little look at an example of a species that can move. So, if we can pan the camera, Nikki, over here, then we can actually see a pair of queen conks down here. And they, can, they are definitely moving about the reef. So these queen conks are actually the largest mollusk or the largest snail that we find here in the Caribbean. And you can see that they kind of jump around the reef. So they are super cool. We can see their eyes sticking out here and they're actually feeding on lots of the algae that is down here on the ground. So they are very cool creatures that we can see down here. Awesome. We have another question and this one is coming from Brooke and Porter. And they're wondering what is the most common invertebrate species on the reef? Ah, oh, that is a great question as well, and it actually all depends on what section or what area of the world that you go to and where you are on a coral reef. Looking around me here, there are lots of different invertebrate species, and I can't quite pick out the one that is the most common, but I am seeing lots of hard coral, lots of soft coral, and lots of sponges as well, so... They're probably some of the most dominant species that we're seeing here. Thank you, Maisie. These are some really great questions coming in from everyone at home. Please keep sending them in, and we're going to continue to answer more throughout this entire broadcast. So, Maisie, you've been able to show us some of these common invertebrate species on the reef, but I'm wondering, what is their purpose? What role do they play on the coral reef? That is a great question. Thank you, Ali. What I do just want to highlight to everyone is that every single creature is really, really important. And they all have an important part to play in every ecosystem because they are all part of a food chain. Now, what is a food chain? Let's start at the beginning. You tend to have your primary producers. So, plants, grasses using the sun's energy to create organic matter. Then you have a small creature, maybe it's an invertebrate, maybe it's a vertebrate, that is eating that. And then you have a larger creature that is eating the smaller creature, and so on and so forth. And the energy is passed up the food chain. Now, if a creature is taken out of this food chain, then what can happen is that food chain can be broken and sometimes there gets a big build-up of certain types of creatures in an environment. So because invertebrates are part of this food chain, it's really important that we keep them around. Now, some species are a little bit more important than others though, and they are called keystone hey, species. Maisie, I'm sorry to cut you off real quick. Yeah. But I just, we had a few more questions really quick that we wanted to try and answer. So one of them is from Ty, and he's wondering, are sponges sessile for their entire life? That is a great question. And yes, some creatures are sessile for their entire life. Just like this sponge that we have right here. This one is definitely not going to grow any legs or any fins and walk around the reef. So yeah, this one is going to stay here for its whole life. That's really great to know. So I know you were telling us a little bit about the food chain and some of these species. Are they all equally important? So, most species are equally important, but as I was saying, there are some species that are a little bit more important than others, and they are called keystone species. Now, these keystone species define an entire ecosystem, so if they are removed, then unfortunately the ecosystem can be changed and damaged. Wow, it sounds like these keystone species are super important for ecosystems 
temperature as well as overall environmental health. Do you think you could give us an example of an invertebrate keystone species? I certainly can, and a great example is actually the long spine sea urchin. Now the long spine sea urchins, I haven't actually seen any around on the reef here, but they are very, very, very important. And what they look like is they're just really, really small little balls, typically black in colour, and they have these long spines that are coming off them. Now on the underside, they have a mouth, and they eat lots and lots of algae, especially that macro algae that we're finding on the reef. So without them, there can actually be a huge amount of macro algae on the reef, which can actually be really bad for it. If you all tuning in saw our Reefs Go Live broadcast from last year with Dr. Claire Dell all about how coral reefs change over time, then you might remember that macroalgae is bad news for coral reefs. Macroalgae can grow a lot faster than corals can, and because of this, it competes with them for the space on the reef. Sometimes this can lead to decreased growth rates and even death in some species of corals. So if you see a lot of macroalgae on the reef, it can be an indicator that the sea urchin population is too low. So Maisie, since you haven't been able to find any long-spined sea urchins today, does this mean that our coral reefs are unhealthy? Well, we're not seeing very many long-spined sea urchins at the moment because they are actually nocturnal creatures. Which is actually the same for a lot of other invertebrate species as well. However, there was actually a huge die-off of the long spine sea urchin in the Caribbean in 1983. They killed around 97% of the population. So yes, their numbers have significantly reduced, which has resulted in a bit of an increase in macroalgae. Wow, this really does go to show just how important these long spine sea urchins are as keystone species. We've had some research recently with the University of Florida, and they've been examining the key populations of herbivore species on the reef, including the long spine sea urchin. It looks like their numbers are increasing, which is really great news for all of our coral reefs. All right, you guys, you have some really great questions coming in, and we're going to answer them very shortly. But before we do, now would be an excellent time to get out those activity sheets and continue to work on them. Please keep sending in all those great questions, and we are going to continue to answer them. Maisie, before we get to some of these questions, have you found any other cool invertebrates down there that you want to show us? So, yeah, definitely. I'm just going to do a little bit of reversing. And what I want us to look at is actually down here, there are actually multiple species of sponges that I think we can all look at. So we have this barrel sponge right at the front here. So remember what I said earlier, guys, with the small little holes at the side, and that is going through and that filtering the water and pushing it out the top here. But we also have another couple of species just round the back, and we can see this yellow sponge that we have right here. We also even have an encrusting sponge that is on the side of this giant barrel sponge as well. So it just goes to show there's lots and lots of diversity between these different groups. That's really cool, Maisie. I'm really excited that you were able to show us that. So we do have some more questions coming in that we'd love to get answered. The first one comes from Molly, and she's wondering if all invertebrates eat algae. That is a great question, Molly. And actually, no, all invertebrates do not eat algae. Just like vertebrates, invertebrates have lots of different varied diets for their different lifestyles. So for example, let's think of two vertebrates, a human and a penguin. Do we eat the same things? Definitely not. And it's the exact same for all the different invertebrate species that we have down here as well. That's really good to know. Another question we have coming in right now comes from Cayman Prep, and they want to know what the rarest invertebrate is in the Cayman Islands. So there are lots and lots of different rare invertebrates in the Cayman Islands. 
and I'm not going to name specifically one but there are a lot of species that are unfortunately endangered and we really do need to make sure that we are protecting them and some of those species are actually corals which we know are very very important to our coral reef ecosystem and there are some species that are really really rare so we do need to make sure that we protect them and to make sure their numbers don't die down anymore yes definitely need to protect these populations another one that we have coming in is kind of an interesting question and they're wondering if it's possible to turn from an invertebrate to a vertebrate that is a great question and unfortunately no you can't just take your spine out one day and decide that you're going to be an invertebrate you are either one or the other although there are some creatures one of them is called a tunicut which for example in its larval stage so when it's very 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 small it actually does have a backbone but when it metamorphoses Morphoses, it actually doesn't have a backbone in its adult life. But because it had a backbone at some point in its life, it is still a vertebrate. So there are some creatures which, you know, do switch between the two slightly, but you're either a vertebrate or you are an invertebrate. That's a really good thing to know and very interesting that certain species can have a backbone in the larval stage and then lose it. So I have a question of my own, Maisie. I know that there are some invertebrate species that people eat, such as conch and lobster. Is it okay if we eat these invertebrate species? That is a great question, Ali, and actually leads us really well into our next point, which is about the threats that invertebrate species face. So one of the key threats that many marine invertebrate species face is actually overfishing. Now, at certain times in the year, around the Cayman Islands, you are allowed to fish certain species, lobsters, conks, and whelks. But this is, as I said, only at certain times of year and in certain places. There are some invertebrate species, however, that you are never allowed to take, such as starfish, sea urchins, and sea cucumbers, because our populations are not large enough to support them being fish. So if you're tuning in from either the Cayman Islands or any other area of the world, I really do want you to please check out your local fishing laws and make sure that you are following them. Thank you for all that great information, Maisie. We do want to make sure that if we are going to eat these invertebrates, that we still keep a healthy population out in the ecosystem. So I have one more question, and that is following into pollution. How does pollution affect invertebrates? So pollution affects every single creature, not just invertebrates. And the two ways that they're really impacting marine creatures are through ingestion, so eating, for example, plastic, or being entangled in it. Now, I want us to think back to the sessile creatures that we looked at earlier. The corals, for example, or the sponges that we have down here. Now, I want to, you to imagine that some of these creatures are wrapped in a plastic bag. Are they going to be able to remove it themselves? Probably not. So it's actually going to have a hugely detrimental impact to their health. Definitely, Maisie. And I think it's also really important to note that many species of invertebrates undertake filter feeding, meaning that they feed and ingest whatever is floating in the water, and they can't distinguish between it. Unfortunately, sometimes this includes things such as microplastics or other types of pollution as well, such as sewage pollution. This is why it's extremely important that all of us work to reduce our pollution. I think this should also help answer Adonzi's question from Terra Nova School about how different species of invertebrates feed. Some are filter feeders, and we can see that here when we're talking about some of those sessile ones, such as corals. So Maisie, we've touched on pollution and we've touched on overfishing, but what about climate change? How does climate change affect invertebrates? 
So climate change can have a huge impact on invertebrates. And one of the reasons why is due to increased sea temperatures. So as the climate warms, so does the ocean too. Now going back to the sessile creatures that we were speaking about just before, this actually affects these creatures the most. As I said earlier, I have never seen a coral or a sponge being able to pick themselves up and move themselves to a different area on the reef. So if it's getting too hot in the water for them to be able to survive, unfortunately they're not going to be able to move away from those elevated temperatures. That is really important. Climate change and the associated increase in seawater temperature can be attributed to the increased amount of greenhouse gases, especially carbon dioxide, in our atmosphere. Usually this is a result of deforestation, land use changes, and the burning of fossil fuels. This excess carbon dioxide can also lead to something known as ocean acidification. Maisie, do you think you could tell us a little bit more about ocean acidification? So as carbon dioxide increases in our atmosphere, actually a third of it gets absorbed into our oceans. Now I kind of mentioned this earlier, but I'm just going to retouch on it. But the corals that we spoke about earlier, they do have a skeleton and it is made out of calcium carbonate. And they extract this from the seawater that is around them. Now, as this carbon dioxide is absorbed by the water, it actually undergoes some reactions and forms carbonic acid. Now, carbonic acid, what I learned in science class anyway, is that acids dissolve things, and they especially dissolve things like calcium carbonate. So, as the ocean becomes more acidic, it actually dissolves the skeletons and shells of creatures like corals, snails, etc. underwater. So as the ocean becomes more acidic, it's going to be much, much harder for them to build these skeletons and to maintain them. This sounds like a huge threat to our coral reefs right now, but also something that everyone at home could help out with by reducing their carbon footprint. Your carbon footprint is the amount of greenhouse gases, specifically carbon dioxide, that you as an individual produce, both directly and indirectly. There's lots of stuff you can do, though, to try and decrease your own carbon footprint. Just for a few examples, you could start by using your five R's. Reduce, reuse, recycle, refuse, and replace. Another great one is to try and switch to a more plant-based diet by decreasing the amount of meat that you have in your diet. Another really good one is to try and cycle or walk more instead of riding in cars. And another great one is to always watch your energy consumption. You can do this at home by making sure that the lights are always turned off whenever you leave the room. We are coming towards the end of our broadcast, but we have so many great questions coming in, and we're going to take the time now just to answer a few more. So a really good one we have comes in from Daisy, and she's wondering, Maisie, if all invertebrates are slimy. Sorry, can you repeat that question again, Ali? She's wondering if all invertebrates are slimy. That is a great question, Daisy. And actually, not all invertebrates are slimy, no. As I said, there's lots of variety in the invertebrate species. Now, marine invertebrates, just like a lot of marine vertebrates, do tend to have that slimy outer covering. But let's think about some terrestrial examples. Most insects that we're finding aren't slimy. So, no, they're not all slimy. But I do want us to look at this invertebrate species that we have up here, which I suppose is a little bit slimy, Daisy. And this is a great anemone that we have up here, which is really, really beautiful. Now, this species, you probably wouldn't believe it, but it actually eats the meat. It is a carnivore. And it uses these tentacles out here to try and capture lots of different fish and lots of other small invertebrates. And it feeds itself through that central mouth that's right 
right in there. So that is another cool invertebrate species that we found on this dive. That's so cool, Maisie. I think we are all wishing we could be down there with you right now. We have another great question coming in, and this one comes in from Kiera. She's wondering if shark cartilage counts as a spine. Does cartilage count as a spine? Yes. That is a very interesting question. In some species, yes, this can count as a spine. Let's think about sharks, for example. They don't have as dense a bone as we do, and they are mainly made out of a cartilage-type substance. But yes, they are still vertebrates because they have that spinal cord and they have that supporting column as well. That's really interesting, Maisie. Another good question we have is coming from Cayman Prep, and they're wondering if there's any poisonous invertebrates under the water. That is a great question, and yes, there are certain types of poisonous and venomous invertebrates, and that is the exact same for invertebrates and vertebrates as well. So there's quite a few. There are some, for example, venomous snails that we find that we need to watch out for. So, but there's nothing too dangerous around me right now. That's good to hear. We're glad you're staying safe. Another great question we have is coming from Isabella, and she was wondering what a tube worm is. I think there's one on their activity sheet, and they're not entirely sure what they are. Oh, that is a great question, Isabella. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to find any on our dive today, but tube worms are very, very cool, and they actually build themselves a nice tube out of sediment and they make a nice home for themselves to live inside of it but when they get scared they retract down into the tube itself which is probably why i haven't been able to find any underwater that's really great to know we had another question coming from alden and alden was wondering why reefs are crucial for the ecosystem that is a great question Coral reefs are crucial for the ecosystem because, well, it says it in the name, doesn't it? Coral reefs are primarily made of coral. So we really need to make sure that we have them here in order to build this whole ecosystem. If we look at this big structure right behind me here, this is built out of the dead and the life skeletons of the hard coral that we're seeing around me. So we have some live patches just up here. Without coral, we wouldn't have any of this ecosystem. So it's very, very important that we ensure that it is still alive and healthy. The corals definitely are a really important part of the ecosystem and we do want to do everything we can pr to, to protect them. Another great question we have is coming from Porter, and Porter wants to know if some invertebrates eat other invertebrates. Yes, some invertebrates do eat other invertebrates, and that relates into the food chains I was speaking about earlier. Sometimes you'll have a very, very small invertebrate, like a very, very small shrimp, for example, and then a larger invertebrate will eat it. Let's think back to the great anemone that I was just looking at, that's just over there now. And that is an invertebrate that eats other invertebrates. That's super interesting, Maisie. Thank you for showing us all these incredible invertebrates throughout this entire dive. Unfortunately, we are coming to the end of our broadcast, and it is almost time for us to say goodbye. But before we do, do you have any last words that you would like to say to our audience today? I just want to say a huge thank you for joining us on our underwater broadcast today. It has been so much fun to have you here. And we really hope that you have enjoyed yourselves. Invertebrates.